Um, I think we can start. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to our next panel on publishing in international higher education. Our panelists are Emeritus uh, Distinguished Fellow at the Center for International Higher Education and Emeritus Professor at Boston College, Hans Jewett, and Professor Elizabeth Buckner at the um, Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. Our speakers will first make a broad overview um, on publishing within the field, and then you are welcome to pose your questions. We encourage you to um, use Zoom raise hand uh, feature, and when invited, you can unmute yourself, turn on your video, and pose your question directly. But of course, in case you cannot do so due to diff different technical difficulties or other issues, you can always pose your question in the chat and we'll be monitoring the chat as well. Um, and now without further ado, I will hold it on to Hans Joyt, please. Thank you, Maya. And uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for joining me in this uh, panel. Always a pleasure. Uh, and talking with you about uh, publishing, uh, academic publishing. Uh, and that's a very broad topic. And uh, I will start more with the general picture and then Elizabeth gives you some uh, handy tips uh, and uh, additional uh, input from uh, after my talk. So, uh, of course, when we talk about uh, academic publishing, in particular for the group of most of you, who are either starting or in the middle of just finishing or finished your, uh, your, your PhD or sometimes your master program, uh, then you have to see well, what is indeed uh, wisdom, uh, where to publish, how to publish and what to publish. Uh, and uh, there's a whole range of possibilities, but there's also a lot of challenges related to that. So finding the right balance and the right approach is, is very essential. And, uh, uh, in particular, if you're talking about international higher education, internationalization of higher education, uh, there are many opportunities, but there are also uh, some challenges. The challenges come in particular from the academic community itself that wants to push you very much to publish in the top peer-reviewed academic journals in the world. And uh, since there are uh, not many of those, and mostly they are in, in English speaking uh, of English uh, publishing uh, journals, it is very difficult for young scholars uh, to get into those uh, journals because they are very critical in their peer reviews. They are uh, having an inclination to be still very Western. They have the inclination to be still very looking at uh, high quality, etc. And that makes it uh, sometimes a challenge to at the same time for if in particular, if you want to pursue an academic career, uh, there is an importance that you have access to those journals. Uh, you can disagree with that, and I disagree with that, but uh, that's uh, unfortunately the harsh reality uh, in academia that still this, this whole pressure of publishing in top academic journals is much more important than, for instance, publishing in books, in book chapters, or publishing in uh, uh, entities like International Higher Education, uh, the, the, the uh, publication of uh, the Center for International Higher Education, or publishing in uh, other entities like University World News or uh, the uh, WNR from uh, from West, etc., uh, which are also very important journals, like also uh, other more uh, popular. Uh, uh, publications like um, uh, diaries, etc., and uh, weeklies, and so on, uh, which much more are directed to the general public than to the um, ivory tower of the academic community. But uh, your pressures, in particular, on um, academic journals, and so uh, that's uh, a thing that you uh, you have to look into how best you can do that. And certainly, uh, Elizabeth will give you some uh, advice on that as well. But the most important is you have to uh, read very carefully what is the purpose of those journals. Uh, so, because each have a different accent in what they want to accomplish, what are the criteria they indicate for peer review, etc., and not simply thinking that you can do a cut and paste of uh, your thesis or something like that. But you have to 
look into making it adaptable as a readable article and what are what is important to, to put into that. So uh, for instance, lengthy literature review is not generally then necessary, but you have to be very clear about your methodology. You have to be very clear about your research questions, but the most important are the findings and the discussion on your findings and then also some of your limitations. But try to focus very carefully when you go into those uh, kind of uh, uh, journals. You also have to be careful uh, for the fact that there is an increase in predatory journals. So journals that pretend to be academic journals of a high quality, but in general uh, are not that high quality and uh, uh, but are not having the kind of quality of peer review. Uh, and so it seems to be easier to access, but at the same time, when you get published in that, it doesn't have recognition by uh, uh, the academics as being a reliable journal. At the same time, also, in many cases, they ask uh, money for your, for publication, and uh, you have to be increasingly in this whole debate about open science and the open access of journals. Uh, you have to find the funding to do that. But then, if you use that funding, use it for the right uh, source and not for predator journals, which don't, don't help you too much. Of course, there's a whole gray area in between the top academic journals and the predator journals. Uh, some of them might be suitable, although uh, maybe not in the top uh, impact rankings uh, for academic publication. Uh, and so look also at those as an option, because uh, that might be uh, more suitable in some cases than uh, 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 going to the top journals and still are not a predatory journal. So look very carefully, ask advice from fellow students, but also from your supervisors or other academics. Uh, what for your type of, uh, of article, it is important to, uh, to go to which uh, journal and how to handle all the constraints. Also, how to handle peer review feedback, uh, which sometimes can be very harsh, sometimes can be very limited, sometimes can even be wrong, and you, or you don't understand what they are going to say. That's also true. Uh, don't get arrogant in your response to them, but try to adapt or make clear why you cannot answer that, uh, that, that comment, why you cannot address it, uh, or how you have addressed it. So make a very clear statement about what uh, uh, you have done in response to the peer reviewers, because they come back uh, when you have to revise. And uh, then uh, if you are uh, not responding well to them, they will be critical. So uh, that's also, unfortunately, a fact that we have, to, we have to be, they are very sensitive people, academics, like everybody else. Uh, so that's around academic uh, journals, but don't exclude also the possibilities uh, of other publications. Uh, yeah, you might look at your thesis, is it publishable as a book? Uh, still also that is not simply just to publish the whole manuscript of your thesis because a book uh, might be different. So look also again, what is the purpose of the book? What are the editorial guidelines for the book, etc.? and how to make it adaptable and ask advice on what book would be a good way. Uh, there are several book series. Uh, uh, we have, uh, especially in internationalization of higher education, there is the, the book uh, series by Elspeth Jones for Rutledge, uh, which is uh, a very good one. Uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, Global Perspectives on Higher Education uh, by the Center for International Higher Education, which uh, is a book series uh, by Brill Sense, which might be possible, but there are increasingly more uh, book publishers that are entering the field of international high education uh, and uh, uh, are a possibility, but also look there what is avoidable, because sometimes those book series are very expensive, they charge you as well increasingly uh, for getting published. Um, and uh, don't expect you ever get rich of an academic book publishing. Uh, that's only for bestsellers in criminal uh, areas, etc., and, and high-level literature. But academics are never getting rich out of it. Uh, it's my opinion, my my experience at least. And I have published quite a lot of books, uh, so I don't go for that. But but still, books, in my view, are underestimated as an important source of information. Uh, in, in particular because of all those rankings and be reviewed and they focus much more on journals than on books, but books can be good and also book chapters can be very useful as an experience. 
but also publications, like I said, University of World News, International Higher Education, uh, Inside Higher Education, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All those publications can be a useful way of disseminate your findings to a broader public than the specialist that you reach by, by journals. Uh, uh, that's uh, also a very good learning lesson is how to focus uh, because it's in general much more difficult in the beginning in particular to write short articles uh, of 1000 words or 1500 words than writing something of 4000 or 5000 words because you have to be very clear about what uh, is the focus of your article, what do you want to express, what is relevant and what is not relevant. And uh, that is, uh, is a learning experience, but can help you also very much in your future publication, because helping you to focus is also necessary in longer articles. And by doing that, you, you learn much of uh, uh, how to do that. Uh, and again, as I said, you reach a much broader audience by it. So don't, uh, don't shy away from that. That's also why uh, in the West CIG Summer Institute, uh, we have the possibility for you to uh, submit uh, your findings uh, for a publication because we know that it's uh, very nice if you have that opportunity to see yourself in, in, in print or these days also online uh, published, uh, but also it, it helps you to learn how to write such court, uh, short uh, articles. So, there's a whole range of issues, there's a whole range of challenges, but don't get discouraged. Uh, trial and error is very important in academic in academia and academia publishing and writing. Uh, don't get discouraged by the feedback you get, uh, feedback, even critical feedback, and sometimes be very uh, good for you to, uh, to help you to, uh, to improve the quality of your writing. Uh, and um, that uh, is part of the whole process. Uh, Peer reviewers are not there to punish you, but to help you. And uh, that's uh, uh, something that uh, you have to keep in mind, uh, even although sometimes you will be shocked by the critical comments that they give. But um, it is all with the good intentions to help you uh, to uh, improve the quality of your, your writing, the quality of your publishing. And uh, yeah, um, that's in essence as a starting point. And I'm happy to have uh, some further questions and discussions later. but. The, the message I want to uh, to start with, and I give the floor to Elizabeth to to follow up on that. Thanks, Hans. Um, hi, everyone. I'm happy yet yeah, to speak. I think um, a lot of what I will say will actually echo the points that Hans raised, but hopefully I'll offer some also specifics on the logistics of, of publishing. So, but. I really agree with Hans, like I'll offer you just starting with this underlying principle of what does it mean to publish, right? Publishing is really putting your ideas and your arguments into writing, in, at least for academic publishing, and then making them accessible to others um, around the world and over time. And so really you can think of publishing as participating in a conversation with others um, and academic publishing as with other scholars, right? So think about that question really deeply. Who is your audience? who do you want to be in conversation with? Because this varies and it really can shape then what journal you're targeting, for example. If you're speaking mainly to a higher education audience, that would be quite different than maybe if you're speaking to a regional studies or an area studies audience or a comparative education audience. So, but internationalization is a topic that can be published in all of those fields or disciplines, for example. And so I'll just, also say one of the best pieces of advice I was given when I was in graduate school was to remember your future audience, right? You don't want your article to only be read this year, but also think of that person 10 years from now who will be reading it. And so you're actually um, trying to write in some cases a, a piece that is relevant well into the future. And I really think that's why we do academic publishing, right? That, I mean, I agree that there are many venues and sometimes especially, you know, with the topic changing so rapidly, such as internationalization, you wanna get it out there for the um, professional audience as soon as possible. But when we're thinking about the purpose of academic publishing, we're taking that data that we've collected or, um, and tying it to more abstract concepts usually and theories. And that then gives it a life that lasts well into the future. And so that's, um, I, I think just remember that you're writing for the future audience as well. And so 
once you think about those things, then you're going to be thinking, okay, where should I aim? You know, what other journals? And so I think Hans really brought these points up, but really there are a lot of journals, obviously academic journals that you can target, but, and, and so figuring out which one is, you're looking for a good fit. And so again, that comes back to the, um, the purpose of the journal. And so I would really read the aim and scope. So every journal website has an aims and scope section, and you can actually go to their website and read that and think, okay, is this what I'm trying to do? Is this my audience? Is this who I'm talking to? And then in that same information on the website, they'll have their word limits. And this is actually very important. Journal word limits can vary quite a bit. So some will be 5,000 or 6,000 words. And then at the higher end, most journals in our field are around um, 8,000 or 9,000 words. Um, very few go over that. Um, but this includes references. And so just remember that, you know, most good articles are going to include a thousand words of references usually. And so you, this is a really important point because you can really develop an argument much more richly and more in depth with a higher word limit. And so, but sometimes that's not your point. Maybe your purpose in another article is just to make one smaller specific point. Um, and so in those cases, a shorter word limit will be fine, but really check those word limits because they can really vary. And sometimes you get rejected from a, I mean, not sometimes, it's very frequent experience. You're getting rejected from a journal that's word limit was 9,000 words and or 8,000 and now you have to go to another journal that's 7,000, that's a lot of words that you're gonna have to cut out, right? And so, um, but that's a very common experience, honestly. And so then the other thing that I'll tell you from for logistics, if you wanna know if you're targeting the right journal, ask yourself if you're citing studies from that journal, look through their recent publications um, in the past five years and are you citing articles that have come out in that journal. Because if you are, then you probably are having those same conversations that the editorial board is looking to have and that other authors who are reading this journal and publishing in this journal are also publishing on, right? And so sometimes that can be a really good sense of, okay, this is the right home for this journal. And if, you're in, if you instead are targeting a journal and you realize like this journal hasn't published anything on internationalization in the past few years, and I can't even find one article here that I wanna cite to sort of make that connection, then maybe it's not the right journal. And um, maybe it is, but maybe it's not. You know, it's, I would just say in my experience, it's much more likely that you'll be rejected from a journal if you are not, um, if you are sort of going rogue in terms of the topics they're covering. So, um, and then just logistically, it can really help um, if you find articles that are on similar topics in that journal, if you actually include them in your references, because that's a signal to the editors who are shopping your article around for reviewers. They often look at your references and go to those authors that you're citing for potential reviewers. So you're sort of doing yourself a favor by making sure that you're citing um, the, sort of other publications in that same journal. So then um, the other thing that I will say is use conferences to draft your papers and determine deadlines because you, you know, we all have many projects that we're working on, many different, you know, even if it's your, just your dissertation or thesis, you know, your many chapters that could potentially become an article. So sometimes, um, you, so we need to set deadlines for ourselves and conferences are really just the, the trick that almost all, um, professors, I would say, use to force themselves to get something ready, right? And so, um, especially conferences that require an actual draft of a paper can really help you set your own goalposts, right? And and really develop an argument and get feedback on it. So um, think about, and we can talk about this, but there's a number of conferences that are really good venues for topics on internationalization. And so then I jump to this question of where should you be publishing? So internationalization is a such an interesting um, field to be in because it's, well, it's not a field really, it's a topic of a study and it's a, we have a shared interest in internationalization of higher ed, but it isn't its own field or its own discipline. We don't really get master's degrees or you know degree programs in this. And so it means that there are many possible homes for research on internationalization. And I think that um, in my experience, the you know, comparative education um, is the broad, is the most specific home. Comparative education, and within that, the subfield of comparative higher ed is usually our best home. But um, so 
but there are different journals. So in comparative education, I would, you can be looking at journals like Comparative Ed Review, Comparative Education, Compare, um, and some of, and the benefit of a journal like Compare, for example, is it comes out much more frequently. So the more times a journal comes out a year, if they have six issues a year, for example, then they just have more articles that they can publish. And so sometimes it's um, to your benefit to be looking at journals that publish six issues a year instead of four, for example. Um, but then within, and, and they all do publish on internationalization or comparative higher ed broadly. But again, but within those journals, you know, higher ed is a subfield and then internationalization is a more niche subfield, right? So, or subtopic. And then you have the higher education journals. And I would say that higher ed is another home and, but, um, there a lot of the, at least in North America, a lot of the journals on higher ed are more you know, American focused. And so if you're not really doing the US then a lot of journals in higher ed are not really accessible to you. But that's where I would say higher education, the journal higher ed is a great home for, um, for internationalization. We also have studies in higher education, which is another great home for internationalization. And then there's a journal that is called the Journal of International and Comparative Higher Education, which is um, an open access journal published by the special interest group of CIS on higher ed, which is another um, great home. And they actually you know, have a call right now for topics related to internationalization in Latin America. Um, and so then we have our specialized journals on internationalization, such as the Journal of Studies in International Education, which really is you know, the, the um, place to go for topics on internationalization. And then the other thing, if you're not, because you don't always get into the, your top choice journey, you may consider other areas. Um, so one, you may also just be speaking to a different audience. So for example, if you study a particular region of the world or a particular country, you may actually be wanting to speak to um, scholars who also study that region. So for example, there are many, many journals you can look into that like a journal that focuses on the Arab world or a journal that focuses on Chinese education or the Asia Pacific um, education. There are many of these that can be really great homes as well. And then lastly, I would say there are discipline journals, you know, but um, it's often hard to publish um, in our, such interdisciplinary work, such as internationalization, specifically in a like a, a sociology journal. But it's not impossible, I would say, especially if you're looking at some of the more marketing. Um, um, for example, a business, you might get into a you know journal of marketing in the higher ed or something like that. So those are some of the actual names of journals that you might want to look into. And then the other thing I'll just comment is if you can publish in an open access journal, I would really consider it. There are pros and cons, and that's something you'd want to talk to your advisor, supervisor, or mentors or peers about um, because some of the you know different publications will have different purposes. And sometimes if you're really trying to establish yourself, you need to try and get into a top tier journal and not all of those are open access. But when you can publish open access and it's, um, then it benefits you because more people around the world who are not um, able to use JSTOR and have you know library will be able to read your article. And so, um, and then they'll also be able to cite it. And so in the long run, you know, people reading and citing your work is um, helping to establish and getting those ideas and arguments out there. So um, when possible, I do think open access is the way to go. Um, and so at least, you know, for and it's not always possible, but sometimes, you know, if you, for example, if you're working with a professor and they have a grant, they might be able to make that um, publication open access. So that's another thing that sort of is, um, you can have that conversation. And then I agree with Hans, you really need to be careful about predatory journals. I think that because they're, they're you know, proliferating and as well as conferences. And so payment is not always a sign of being predatory. There are a few journals that require a certain amount of money to review an article, but it's very uncommon in our field. None of the journals that I mentioned do require any sort of payment for review. Um, and so, if and also I would just, this is something you definitely want to talk to an advisor or supervisor or mentor about. Um, if you're getting asked for something and you're thinking of sending it to one of these journals, just double check with them that it's not predatory. Because if you're being asked and invited by someone you don't know and you don't recognize their name, you don't recognize their scholarship or their institution, then um, 
you that's a sign like why are they asking you to submit and what will be the benefit to you you know um you definitely don't want to pay and then have your work published in a journal that is not really going to be accessible to others and that others don't buy it, it there you know the concept of legitimacy as we we study uh, many of us study is very important you you want your work to be seen as being published in a reputable um, home and so then um I'll just say a few other things. So I often get asked about the question of collaboration or um, ordering of authorship, but there, these vary by field, um, what the norms are in our field of education broadly, comparative and higher ed, all of those fields, um, sociology, whatever, how, wherever you place yourself, collaboration is very common and it's seen as very good um, because you know why you, we often, you know, um, deepen our ideas and our arguments in conversation with others. Um, it is definitely the norm that you to get authorship when you are contributing substantially to the article, if you're not also getting paid for it as a RA, for example. Um, but that because that's not always the case in other um, fields, like in psychology, even if you know, if the PI will get authorship, whether or not they contributed substantially to the publication. But I think in general, in our field, you know, you need to actually contribute to the writing to get authorship. Um, but, and and so then it, it's important if you're working with another student or a professor to have the conversation of what order authorship will be in. And you need to think about um, like, about having some solo authored and some multi authored. In general, if you're trying to establish yourself as a um, student or scholar, it can be important to like publish at least one thing in your own name. I would just say without um, having other people's names attached because at least that was the advice I was given. It helps you sort of be known at that, you, that you can publish something on your own. Like, so I guess what I'm trying to say is both while collaboration and co-authorship is very common, very common in our field, that um, it's still the gold standard for getting an academic position is that having at least one solo authored journal article in the peer reviewed journal article. That is, you know, for good or bad, that's the norm in the field. So that's something that you would wanna be working to over your years of graduate school or after. Um, and that's something you should talk to your supervisors again about your advisors. And, um, I think that, oh, so I'll just touch on the last points about peer review, um, which Hans also brought up. So it's start, you know, peer review, I, it's hard um, and sometimes reviewers can be harsh, unfortunately. I think that in education generally, we tend to be kinder um, than some of the other disciplines, but uh, uh, it's still, reviewers can be quite harsh, um, but I still, even despite that, I try to start with an attitude of appreciation, not antagonism, right? Your reviews are not your enemies. They are giving their time voluntarily to reading your um, article and offering feedback. And so, and in general, I think that it's just incredibly valuable. It's an, a great process because it's, it like invariably in my work, it strengthens the quality. It pushes me to, you know, substantiate claims and to um, improve my arguments, honestly. And so that's how I see it. And I'm always very, very appreciative of my reviewers. But at the same time, um, you know, that you, you have to develop thick skin because not all reviewers are kind. Um, and so, that's just, that is our, that is our profession. You know, that is our choice that we have gone into this willingly. And that is part of the job, unfortunately, is like getting used to being rejected and trying again and just saying, um, you know, sometimes you get rejected. It doesn't necessarily mean that the publication is bad at all. It could just not be in the right home. You can actually take a public application that's totally rejected and just send it out again with no changes made just to a different home and have it be accepted, you know, eventually. So it's not always, um, but I, but read the reviews closely and see if there are like nuggets that are helpful for you to take away from. Um, and so I will say reviewers almost always ask for more, right? They're like more and more and more, please add more to the, the references, more to the literature review. So this is something that we all deal with. Um, 
but it means that you know your paper was already at eight thousand words, and now they're being you're being asked for another you know two pages of this and two pages of that and more references. So it's very common to be asked for you know more content and yet be up against a word limit. And so this is one of the arts of publishing that you have to get better and better at, which is being more and more succinct. And that's um, you know when publishing and specifically talking about publishing in English, it's a you know, it's a value in English writing in general to be as succinct as possible, which is not always, it's not this shared universally. I know that like, for example, in Arabic, repetition is actually valued. And that's sort of an unfortunate uh, difference in terms of how, if you want to publish in the English um, language, you have to sort of get used to those norms. And so I do think that's something where you can just uh, seek help, um, get from editors, from copy editors, because um, we, because you, generally need to keep the ideas and just make it more dense so in terms of density of ideas, because it's it's very um, un unlikely that you're going to be able to get rid of a whole section to make room for what the reviewers are asking for. Um, so, um, and then, yeah, look to your peers and colleagues, like you start with your actual peers, um, have them, ideally you can, I know our graduate students have a WhatsApp group and there's super supportive of each other. So if you have actual peers, you can ask or pr try presenting at a thesis group or a seminar, whatever your institution offers um, in order to start there. Because uh, what you want is to get good feedback from your peers first that strengthen the paper before you send it out for review. Because if the same, because that will make it less likely that the reviewers will catch those same points or raise those same points and reject it because what what you're really looking for from a peer review um, is an R and R like you know a revise and resubmit. It is almost it is extremely rare, very very unlikely that your first um, draft to a an academic journal will just be like accept um, or accept with very few revisions, minor revisions. So you normally, um, especially at the more you know top like tier journals, you're going to get asked for a revision. And so um, in those cases, you're, you know, you just make those revisions and that's sort of, they often don't give r and rs and if they don't think that it's publishable. So it's actually a very, very good thing to get invited to revise a manuscript. So um, that's what you're looking for. Um, I think that's all I have for now, but um, I'll stop there and we can open it up to Q&A. Yeah, maybe, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we're also following up on what you are saying on, on some topics which might be uh, relevant. If we, uh, and we have done a question with Marissa already, which I can start to, to answer and then we can look further. Uh, one is, uh, yeah, you mentioned order of authorship. I think that's uh, uh, one of the most complicated discussions that sometimes PhD students encounter because uh, there's also this pressure of uh, sometimes supervisors that want to be part of the publication and then uh, do they have to go first or do they have to go second? Uh, uh, in my view, uh, always you only have to include authors as co-authors, which really have made a very substantial contribution to the article. But of course, there is some unethical issues, unfortunately, that supervisors think that they are, uh, have to be included in publication, although they have only made a supervisor role and not an active role in in in, uh, in authorship and sometimes even claim to be the first that's a very complicated situation in us author and sometimes be careful about how to address that but at the same time don't let yourself be pushed to the side uh, by um, this kind of issues uh, but there's also sometimes and i i have that uh, but uh, certainly elizabeth might have that as well that you are called by uh, phd students can you be co-author of my paper because I think I have a higher chance than to get published. And uh, then I always say no, unless I have made indeed uh, at least a 40% yeah, a contribution to the article, uh, because I think that's unethical as well. Uh, but also it doesn't help you much because most of the peer reviews are blind, so they don't see who are the authorship, so it doesn't help you at all. Uh, so don't fall in that trap that you really have to be uh, seen by uh, as being publishing with some kind of renovated uh, supervisor. So those ethical issues are, are sensitive issues, but are very important to keep in mind as well. Uh, 
uh, and but include sometimes peers. I mean, uh, I've seen some examples that you can include your peers as a co-author because they have substantially contributed to it, and that helps you as well uh, to get much more active. And indeed, uh, co-authored publications, in particular with co-authors from different uh, nationalities, are much more important uh, as considered. So. Uh, don't exclude the possibility to co-author. I, I like to co-author with people, but then be careful how you do that and uh, uh, to make it a really significant contribution of all those who are involved. Luckily enough, we are not in the sciences where sometimes you have co-authors listed like 25 or 30 or even 100. Uh, mostly our groups are much smaller to uh, two persons or three persons or maximum of five. That makes it easier to collaborate and also makes it easier to convince people that they only are co ordered when they are in a substantive group. Uh, specialized issues. Increasingly, you see that journals are um, having specialized issues on, on, on a special team. Uh, so be alert to look into is there, are there calls for special teams that you can contribute to because that's the topic of your journal. So that's a very good way also to. To, to find the right uh, fit for your article if it is in a special issue of the journal. Uh, so that's that's fairly important. And then uh, what we see increasingly, of course, is that PhDs are not uh, more anymore a monograph of a thesis, but are based on publications. Uh, and that uh, is uh, something that uh, you want to look into more and more. Uh, it, it happened originally, in particular, in the in the management and business uh, and communication journals, but now it is quite common everywhere, also in education, that you uh, you don't do a, a monograph thesis on one subject, but you break it up in different parts and you publish first in a in journal and then it, uh, you bring it together with an introduction and conclusion into a PhD thesis. Uh, which uh, sometimes is, can be uh, very useful, but not always. So be very careful when you start with that to find the right uh, approach, what is helping for you, uh, and what uh, also what your supervisor, but your peers recommend to do. Um, it, it's 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 more complicated, in particular in the American system, where you have a shorter period of uh, uh, of working on your thesis because you have your coursework coursework. Than it is, for instance, in Europe, when you have really working three to four years completely on your thesis, and then you can break it up easier, I think, than if you have a very short period. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, and that comes me to also the question of uh, Marissa, which says, well, how to decide to break up a larger project like a dissertation to several articles? Uh, uh, that's uh, indeed a, a, a good point uh, to make because. Uh, you uh, you want to publish as much as possible out of your dissertation, not one article, uh, but uh, maybe two or three uh, that uh, are relevant. So uh, look also carefully when you design your thesis, what can I do to break it up in, in articles and uh, what is then the right focus? Uh, a, a literature review, as I mentioned, and also Marissa mentioned, yeah, sometimes that's very repetitive and many journals would say, well, uh, uh, we are not interested in literary review articles uh, because that already has been done or it is uh, it's not really adding something new to the field. Uh, so even a literary review, you have done to, uh, uh, to make it more different than it is simply the literature review on your thesis. You have to focus it on the, a question and then how the literature review will help you. And then you have to make an analysis of the literature review to make it productive. So. Uh, the, your findings are, of course, very clear into uh, making into a publication. Sometimes you can break up the findings in two or three articles, uh, depending on the scope of your dissertation. Uh, uh, methodology is also in itself not really interesting as a kind of uh, article, uh, but you have always to use the methodology in connection to your findings, so you cannot exclude from that. But uh, it's. Uh, uh, yeah, it is again something you have to be discussing very carefully with your supervisor and uh, um, depending on the topic, but maybe Elizabeth has some views on that as well. Yeah, I agree with that. I will say it is okay to repeat your sort of data and method to, you know, to repeat data and methods in different journals, but I would, um, I mean, different articles like that, that happens because we sometimes use the same data set, for example, for different um, arguments. It's just that the key in order to 
remember you're also convincing the journal, the you know the editorial, the editors and the reviewers that this is an important argument. So I and it's an important thing, you know. Um, so that's how I think of it. It's like okay, divide it up by what is an interesting novel argument and. Uh, that's, and so sometimes that it does work as chapters, you know, one chapter is one focus, but sometimes you might have, especially with quantitative data, for example, we often find, um, you know, we'll have the same description of what the data set is, how we collected it, how we analyzed it, but that, you know, it ends up being one publication on national differences and one on institutional differences, you know, something like that. Yeah. Okay, anybody? else uh, about Maya, you, you can take the lead on it. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to ask the same. So we addressed Marisa's question. So Arsika, would you like to unmute yourself and pose your question? Sure. Sure, thank you. I think Dr. Buckner had a hand up. So I just wanted to make sure if she wanted to add anything before. Oh, no, I, I want to. Um, answer your question. Once oh, you great. Thank it. you. Thank you so much for this wonderful panel. Um, it's really great to hear, like, why do we publish and how some books are on, undervalued, unfortunately, all of this. But um, given how publications uh, still sort of create the currency for us to stay in academia and sustain ourselves in academia, I was just wondering if you could advise on managing multiple projects or any self-care tips or um, for us to make an academic career sustainable. Thank you. Yeah, I would love to answer this question. It's a great question. That's so great. yeah, thanks um, for asking that because I agree there is so much pressure to publish and and so we come down to this uh, you know the fundamental trade-off of quality versus quantity sometimes I mean we could debate hopefully it's not such a trade-off but there I think when you're um, you know trying to establish yourself you do um, run into this question of because it can take a really long time to um, you know, you're molding data into an argument so you realize you need to go back and reread a whole literature that you haven't read, you know, there's a like publishing and then going through a review process and getting hard critical but important feedback, meaning, oh, I need to then go back and re reflect, I need to recode data, I need to reanalyze data. like the, I would say the articles that um, I consider, you know, my best like quality of articles and that also the, the quality is not always reflected of where they make it again in, in what journals they're published. You can have a really great, fabulous article that's not necessarily in a top tier journal, but they're often highly correlated, right? And so the ones that I am really proud of because I went and they, they did take longer. They took a long time. Like I had to go back and remold and rework. And so there is going to be some trade-off because we only have so much time. And I definitely think that to, um, you know, I don't have self care tips other than make sure you're making time, you know, take time, take your weekends, take, you know, a disconnect, right? Because it is what in the long haul, you need that energy to sustain you. And so I do think there is that trade off. And so, um, or there can be that trade off. And so one thing I would say is, I make sure you're talking to your advisors about what journals, because some journals are sort of infamous for taking a really long time to get feedback. And it can be really harmful to junior scholars and junior um, who are trying to publish a single author, you know, journal article to then have a manuscript sit. So it's definitely happened to me. It's happened to a lot of people I know where you send it to a journal that you, you know, you're targeting, you'd really like it to get published there and it'll sit for eight months. I've had things and then um, no word, no response and then just reject it, you know? this is not, it used to be not uncommon at all. I think journals are finally trying to um, cut down a little on that and they are giving reviewers much shorter timelines now, but it isn't uncommon to just, you know, it goes into an, 
abyss and you don't hear for months and months. I mean, I think in general, in our field, many journals are targeting in a three month response, um, three to four to six months is very normal, right? You send an article off, you should hope to get feedback within four months, usually, um, it, whether you get an r and &R, um, or not, sometimes six months. But the ones that are going eight, nine months, um, you just, it's, it can be harmful because then if it's rejected, you have to start the process over again, right? And so your advisors will know which journals these are usually, like they're, they're pretty known in the field. And so um, I would just, uh, and, and I would say that's different from, um, there are also journals that have really long backlogs. And that means that like it, you get, it's accepted, but it won't come out literally um, for another year in print. That's okay. Those journals are fine because if it's accepted and you have a DOI and you have it as a forthcoming on your CV, then you're set. And like there are also a lot of those journals, you know, it doesn't actually come out in print with the volume issue page number for I've had journals like two years, you know, but that's fine because that's still a, a, a forthcoming publication. So that those are not what you need to worry about. You need to worry about the ones that have the really long lags in review process on and, um, and then I would say that the way that I manage my quality quantity is to really try some of both. And this, I'm not sure that this, I would say for junior scholars, it really depends on what you're trying to do, but you could go some of both, like, but make sure you're saving your like best work that, you know, that really great piece that's coming out of your thesis that you spent years doing that you want to try and publish as a single author journal article in a, in a you just do like that will because that is often yeah the a signal for a hiring but in the meantime if you also have time you can be trying to um, publish uh, co-authored um, shorter pieces, lots of different venues. I would say one of the pieces of advice I give my students is like, you don't publish too many book reviews, for example, do like one book review, maybe two, but like you don't want to pad your CV with things that are not really considered valuable in the academic, um, you know, for good or bad, that's true. So I sometimes have students who think that book reviews are equivalent to publications and they're not really. So one or two is fine, but um, then, yeah, that's my advice. And sorry, it's a little, it's a little maybe strategic or cynical in a way, but like, that's the reality. I think of being in this very competitive yeah. job market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me follow up on that. And I also then go to the question by uh, Tukai uh, Durak uh, um, about the expire date, but first, uh, yeah, uh, Elizabeth is right. I mean, there are two aspects on it. One is uh, indeed the peer review process can sometimes take a lot of time. That's quite frustrating because then indeed, if you then have to be reacted or you have to make radio revisions, it becomes longer and longer because then you have to wait again for the peer review or you have to go to another journal. That's that's really frustrating. So be also careful indeed to look at the journals that uh, might be doing that more than the other ones, but also don't hesitate sometimes to uh, either ask for uh, what is the status of my peer review process, uh, uh, because that puts pressure on uh, the editors also to um, to look into it. Because sometimes uh, they have so many manuscripts to overview that they lose sight about it, and uh, then they are getting alert and they can say, "Well, this this peer review has been too late. Uh, we have to, we will look for another one to respond more quickly, etc." So, uh, but it is it is uh, one of the big frustrations and. Uh, then if you get accepted in a journal uh, in these days, indeed, many journals now have also what they call online first. So they, they, then it's published already as a paper online, but not in the journal issue itself. And that makes it, uh, uh, makes it already fine for you to use it and to be cited and to reference, et cetera. So uh, that, uh, that is more modern. By books, it depends very much on the book publishers. Uh, some book publishers are also taking a long time in particular the um, the university presses i have experienced that it can take uh, sometimes two or three years and then many of your data already are uh, different because internationalization in particular is a very rapidly evolving uh, 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 development and if you then are uh, 
too uh, too late with your data, then it gets quite frustrating. I mean, uh, think about all those um, poor uh, uh, scholars who have been working on Russian higher education pre the invasion, and now basically that has become history because the uh, the, the implications are quite different uh, uh, in Russia these days. Uh, by I mean, I have two or three of them, and that's uh, that's quite frustrating for them how to how to present that data still as being valid, although the reality in Russia has been changing. So, yeah, uh, and that brings me to a two-way question. Is there an expire date? Uh, that's, yeah, you cannot simply answer that for every PhD. It depends very much on the data that you have collected and how valuable it is in, in that context still. Uh, I would say that it, uh, it should not extend more than something like three or four years uh, and the sooner the better uh, there's not a general rule in my view but uh, uh, it, it, it's yeah it depends very much also on the data that you have collected and uh, uh, but maybe elizabeth has a, a different view or a different experience with that yeah i would just for the i do think it's, just, it's an interesting question people ask a lot i do think circumstances can change a lot and that, but yeah i like hans's point that it really it is going to depend on the data some of it is you know really novel rich data that you couldn't get elsewhere or couldn't and that's not updated you know i i have published things on very old data and that's um because it, but I, as long as you think that either the data is still valid, I mean, it hasn't changed, or you can sort of theorize the, the um, findings that, from that data, and you think that those arguments continue to be valid, even if the circumstances have changed. So yeah, I, um, then it could, you know, you can still publish on it. I don't think there's like a, there's not going to be a a cutoff of like, oh, this data is, um, you know, no longer valid. Yeah, okay. And then there's a question by Shinji Katsumoto about when a manuscript was rejected by top journals a couple of times, what would be the best strategy to go to the next top journal or to go to a lesser elective journal? Uh, and of course, there is the pressure of then of the job market that uh, one should get published. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's a good question, but it's also difficult to answer. I mean, I I would say um, to a certain extent, you have to be wise. I mean, uh, again, you should not go to a predatory journal. Uh, but some of the journals, uh, like for instance, now an emerging journal like the Journal of International Students, uh, can be a good uh, option to to go to. Uh, which um, is more frequent, et cetera, and is also uh, accepting uh, more articles, uh, although it still uh, is of uh, good quality. Uh, yeah, sometimes you have to take your losses to a certain extent and then go to, uh, to go away from an absolutely top journal, because if it has in particular been reacted two or three times by a top journal, then you know that it's going to be difficult. And you, you still have learned a lot from the peer review process in that to, to focus it more and to get the feedback so what is uh, wrong. But then the chances that another top journal will take it are less likely. And then, yeah, you have to look, can I publish it in other form in another way still to have my, uh, my academic record? Uh, I answer the next question and Elizabeth and Minta can answer both questions as well, given also a little bit of time. Uh, languages uh, and in journals. Uh, again, a good question and not easy to answer. Uh, of course, most of the top journals and even of the intermediate journals are in English. That's that's uh, unfortunately a fact uh, that in reality uh, there are uh, journals in other languages, French, uh, Spanish in particular. Uh, sometimes German, um, increasingly also in Chinese and in Arabic, uh, but uh, uh, then they don't appear so easy in the top uh, rankings of uh, citations, etc. And so uh, it's more difficult, but uh, yeah, I would still look into those options if possible, if it makes sense, in particular, if the topic is very more relevant to that the, the country where that language is spoken. Uh, and uh, try to see what is possible. I think in the, the, 
we unfortunately are still in a stage where the dominance of English language in publishing is, is very high. I think in the future, with increasing quality of uh, uh, Google Translate and other translations uh, on um, mechanisms and technologies, uh, this might change, but that will take still at least a decade before it really has an impact on academia and academic publishing. It has much more on popular publishing and so on. So uh, it's, yeah, I, I don't really have a good answer to that, but it's, uh, it's complicated, uh, but I would still look into the options uh, if possible. Elizabeth. Yeah, great points. I, I will ask, okay, yeah, um, Shinji, it's a really important question. I think what you need to do is talk to your, talk to someone and like a mentor, or advisor, supervisor, someone about why the journal is being rejected because there are, um, and because it's going to be specific to the article. And, you know, I, I found that, you know, it's just, there are some journals where like, you think your data is great, but the reviewers are like, no, there are these fundamental flaws with the data and it's never going to get published. And, you know, in, because the, at, you know, the standard is it should have been corrected like this, even though you have really interesting findings, for example. So some, and so for those, I would cut my losses definitely. And for other cases, like, um, you know, maybe it does make sense to continue trying. So, and, and just remember like the, the quality of the article, the quality of the argument is not always reflected in the journal it's published in. Some of my favorite articles ever are not necessarily published in like the top um, tier journals. And sometimes the ones that are cited the most definitely aren't published in those that are behind firewalls, for example, you know? So like, just don't think that quality is always mapped onto the status of the journal. Sometimes it's more about the, per, you know, the preoccupations of the readership and the, who they're getting as reviewers in those journals. But yeah, um, so I, I would just talk to someone about what, what are, why does it keep getting rejected as well? Um, and then the other thing, yeah, I, I think Hans raised really great points. I think that Santiago, your question is really like, what are you, what do you want to, for your future? Because I know that if you want an academic job in a, in a different country outside of North America, then you, um, then you may need to understand what the norms are in that country. I know that like, for example, some of my students who are potentially interested in working in China, um, the norms for academic publishing are very different there and they are needing to straddle two different um, cultural expectations where, you know, in China, you might be expected to publish a lot more shorter pieces, definitely single authored. And in North America, we're like, no, go sh longer, quality is better, English, et cetera. And so if you are really planning to make a future in North America and that's where you want an academic job, then I do think that um, publishing in English is, and is going to be a priority. And it's sometimes hard to make the um, make topics to, in, of interest to North American audiences. I found that, you know, myself, but if you're considering a career in, in any, you know, in other parts of the world, then publishing in the domestic education journals in those languages, like obviously English is always going to be a bonus, but that you want to make sure that you're also engaged in those conversations in those journals, you know? So I really think that's um, a question of what you want. Yeah, and maybe a final remark, which not so much has to do with language, but still with, with more content in, on that topic. Uh, try to uh, use resources much more international. Uh, and in, even in internationalization, I still see in most, by, by American authors, I see sources from US journals, etc. cetera. And uh, you have to look into what is happening in Canada, what is happening in Australia, what is, what is published in Europe, what is published in the global South, make reference to that. Uh, because that gives you a much broader horizon and makes it much more interesting also for you to be uh, accepted for careers in, in other countries. But it is still in particular most important to, to get out of this narrow mind of uh, um, America, academia are the greatest of the world, which is uh, not really true, although the rankings uh, suggest that. But uh, there are many valuable other sources in the world which uh, are important to keep in mind as well. Thank you very much to our presenters for this very, very insightful tips and information. I think it's crucial for our future careers. Also, I want to thank our attendees for posing these great questions. 
I want just to quickly remind everyone that our next session starts at 12.30 Eastern time, which is just in half an hour. Um, so I think it gives you enough time to grab a cup of coffee and stretch. But for those ones who didn't have a chance to attend our previous text drop-in session, if we have anyone like this in our call, please stay in for like a couple of minutes so that we can check your presentation sharing mode. So thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Maya, for such great moderating. I'll see you guys at 1230. Yeah, see you later. Hello. Um, could Paul Addo's team and 